It's on now. There we go. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here at this conference. I'm very excited. I do apologize for the questionable speaker. Um, we did do some research on this, and we decided that's the best we're going to do. So I guess I could try yelling really loud, or hopefully you'll be able to put up with um, what is it, less than optimal sound system. Uh, my name is Bruce Momj. I do live in Philadelphia. I was last at this event in 2015. I enjoy this event, and I've been trying to come pretty much for the past nine years. <laughs> and I always either had a conflict or I couldn't get approval or something, but hopefully I'll be here a lot more often. This is a great, I get a lot of energy from this event. I don't know about you, but um, there's just so much uh, spirit, I'd say, and um, sense of uh, curiosity in the group that I really, this is the kind of event I, where I learn a lot, so I, I really do appreciate this. Uh, I will be giving three presentations during this conference. Today, it's home automation. Today, it's home automation. I guess I won't be walking as much as I thought. Um, tomorrow, it'll be AI and Postgres. And then uh, on Sunday, I'll be talking about the Postgres optimizer. I actually, um, I'm one of the Postgres core team members. I work for a Postgres support company called EDB. Uh, I travel about 90 days a year, about 30 events a year. Uh, my website is right here, so this uh, presentation is one of 62 presentations on my website. Uh, that QR code should work um, if you'd like to scan it. I don't know if the resolution is good enough, but um, hopefully um, you'll be able to take a look. This, uh, this talk is sort of dear to my, near and dear to my heart because it is about something very personal to me, and that is uh, the home automation environment that I live in at home. Um, and I have for the past 20 years. So uh, this is kind of a new, uh, I'm sorry, this is a, a, a very personal thing. Um, and frankly, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, use this technology for home automation, use that technology for home automation. If you can think of the 20 years that we've been involved with, um, well, home automation goes back to the 80s, but for the 20 years I've been involved, I've seen so many things come and go. <laughs> over the years, right? And um, I've been able to basically ride them out. And some of the technologies that I was told were better than what I have have now become obsolete or um, are no longer desirable. So what I really hope to do is to get you excited about what is possible with home automation, give you sort of a roadmap of how I view home automation problems and solutions and obviously to get you to be more excited about implementing this yourself. But at the same time, I'm going to give cautionary uh, concerns. And that is that, and I'll give some personal stories, but if you go into home automation too quickly and you, uh, I, you know, I live with my four children, my wife obviously, uh, I have an aunt with us, and I had a, a father-in-law who lived with us for 19 years. So um, if I get ahead of them in terms of home automation, it can be very stressful on them. So I'm going to give sort of some cautionary, how do you approach automa automation? How do you basically get 
your family involved in the team of home automation and help them to see it as a positive, okay? Um, again, yeah, uh, the slides you're looking at are, are at that URL right there. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk first about computerized home automation. What is that? What, is it, what does it do? Um, then we'll talk about evaluating various technologies. I actually standardized on a technology that you may have never even heard of that's been around, I think, since the 80s, believe it or not. Um, but what's more interesting is as we get into sample number three and four, we're going to talk about specific, solving specific problems in a way that benefits your family. Um, I have a cousin who's somewhat of a gadget freak, and I don't know how many of you have relatives like that. But when you go over their house, like you're, you're scared of touching anything because you don't know what it does, right? And there's all these things that are happening that you're not quite sure of. Heaven forbid you stay overnight and there's these weird things that happen. Um, so again, we'll talk about how to kind of look at home automation from a practical standpoint, uh, and then I'll talk about some applications to end. Okay, so um, some of the history of home automation. I don't remember how many of you remember the clapper. That was a big thing, I think, in the... Was it the 90s? Yeah, clap on, clap off, if that, yeah, I know, yeah, exactly. Um, kind of crazy, but it, it was trying to solve a specific problem, and it actually solved it to some extent. Um, dawn and dusk sensors we've had for years, right? Uh, a lot of uh, outside lighting has that built in. Uh, we have motion sensors, which have gotten a lot more sophisticated over time, even to the point where They'll identify humans versus animals and, you know, amazing stuff coming out. Uh, and then timers. I, I actually, I'm 62 years old, so I remember that you'd have like a timer. You'd plug, you still use these things where you plug it into the wall. It's got like a dial and then it brings on your lights at some time. Uh, but then, of course, when you lose power, you got to kind of go back and set them. In daylight savings time, you have to set them and so forth. Um, so there has been a history of home automation. It goes long b before computing. Um, but what I'm really going to focus on is what I would say the... Uh, well, I am, I'm a database guy. So there's something called in database called data gravity. And what data gravity means is that data wants to be near other data. The sense that uh, when you're looking at a problem, you may not know looking at some data what the answer is, but if you have access to other data, you can solve the problem a lot easier. And you see that in organizations a lot. So they'll have a data silo, you know, data warehouse system that has some data, and they'll have a, maybe a, an entry log that has some data, and then web traffic has some data. But putting that all together, all of a sudden you can solve problems that you couldn't solve when they're separate. And what, what I've learned and I'll show you a lot of examples of this, is that um, when you put these home automations under user control, whatever the tool is, um, you all of a sudden have more capabilities than, um, than, than you have if you look at each item discreetly, okay? And I think that's, that's a big, um, what's, the, what's the name of the big home automation tool, home kit, what is it, home? Home Assistant, yeah, my son uses that all the time. Um, again, a great example of having all of your automation together and being able to kind of unite it and create basically an environment where the things can work together. Another challenge, and it actually, the reason I got involved most, I think, initially was, was distance limitations. For example, uh, when you walk into my bedroom, okay, so the bed is over there, right? And then the light switch is over here. So well, how do you get into bed at night, right? Um, you know, you turn the light on, you go into the bedroom, you wash up. Then, then if you, do you go back to the switch and then turn off the light and then walk in the dark to the bed? Or um, it, it, it can be a problem, right? So um, maybe you have a lamp next to the bed. So then every day, you walk in, you can't turn that light on because it's dark, so you have to turn this switch on. Then you go over to the bed, you turn your lamp on, then you go back to the switch, you turn it off, then you wash up and go to bed, and then you turn the light off at the bed, okay? Um, 
yeah, it works, but is that really the best solution? In, in a lot of ways, it isn't. Um, so in ways, some ways, home automation allows you to, to change distance uh, limitations. Uh, activity detection, if somebody comes in the garage, if somebody walks by something, you can do things. Um, and again, once you make it scriptable, then you can do all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and you can also think, do access to external data. So I may, in, in a later example, I want to show a case where I have a pool, and the, the warmer the temperature, the more you have to run the pool pump. Okay? So how would you, how would you do that? Well, you could look at the weather every day and technically go out to the pool pump and say, oh, it's going to be warm today. Let me make it run longer. Well, I'm not, I know I'm not going to do that, right? So maybe every week you do that. Maybe two weeks you do that. But then when you forget, and I travel a lot, like how does that work? So all of a sudden I can go out, I can reach out and say, what's the temperature today you know, on the Internet? And then I can control some, the pump live based on the weather. Um, so again, some interesting things I'll kind of get into, but the idea of great data gravity, of bringing all of your automation together in one place where you can control it, has a lot of utility. So um, I'm not going to really, again, I'm not going to pitch one particular um, network or, ne or home automation API, but we actually have networks in our home that we may or may not realize. So for example, uh, wired telephone, I'm not sure how many houses still have that. Um, it used to be RJ, was it? RJ11, now it's RJ45, right? Uh, my son just bought a house. He fortunately has RJ, RJ45, Cat 5E in his walls, even though that was originally used for phone, he can use that for network. But again, a lot of car, uh, homes already have that. Um, Cordless telephone, right? That's kind of a network, wireless. Um, uh, uh, coax is actually a network. I should have added that here. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have done something called Mocha, but you can run, thank you, you can run Ethernet over coax. So my home has coax um, because it's an older home, and I'm able to get Ethernet into some rooms that I have trouble getting to by running Ethernet over coax. You actually go, you have, actually have gigabit speeds on that coax. So there's nothing wrong with coax in terms of capability. It isn't CAT 5E, it's not CAT 6, but it is certainly capable of getting you an Ethernet jack if you do not feel like running wires um, either through the floor or through, the, through the, the, the ducts. If you're running plenum, if you have special cable for that, I ended up not going there. Certainly Ethernet, wireless, uh, Wi-Fi, 802.11. The electrical system is actually a network in your house. You may not realize that. Um, and again, we have new wireless sort of networks coming, particularly things like mesh networks where uh, you're having a hub and then that uses a special frequency to connect to another hub, which then gives you 802.11 in that area. If you ever used that mesh idea. I've avoided it myself, but I, I know a lot of houses that do use that. So, um, the, the, so there, I'm just, this is kind of a general idea of the, of the popular home automation solutions that are out there. Um, X10 is actually the one that I used and again goes back to the 80s. It is a crazy interface and a crazy way of doing networking. But it has stood st st to the test of time for me, and I'm not sure if that would apply to anyone else. I'm not sure I would start with it now, certainly. But it had all of the capabilities that I needed. So one of the things when you start looking at this type of interface is do you have a network that supports all of the interfaces you're going to need? That may be switches on the wall. That may be 220 control of motors. That might be outlets. That might be chimes. That might be sensors. So as you start to look at which of the network, what a home ch network interface you choose, you better figure out which ones you're going to use. And if you need to use multiple, then you're going to need to have an interface that knows about multiple at the same time. 
For example, if your motion sensor is on one network type, but your lights are on a different one, then if you want to synchronize a motion with a light, you're going to need some API that understands both of those that can read the traffic, right? So again, it, it, it's, you're going to start with one thing. You're going to start with one need in your, in your home, but you have to realize that you're going to have, over time, that's going to grow. I'll tell you some stories about that as we go, um, and that's sort of a challenge. Um, the, um, the big one, I think, is Zigbee. That is an IEEE standard, uh, very common. Although the problem now is that although, although a lot of devices are Zigbee, they're somewhat... Zigbee was designed to be a universal standard for everyone, okay? But as you are probably familiar with, as soon as companies get involved, there's always the hook, right? So what you see a lot of times is that companies will support Zigbee, but all of the features aren't necessarily available in the Zigbee API. So I'm thinking of um, uh, Hue Lights, I think from, um, who is the Hue guys? Uh, Philips, thank you, I knew it was a P. Philips, yeah. And there's been a whole bunch of controversy over, yeah, it kind of works, but then if you want to do certain things, you have to use the Philips. And then you need a Philips hub. And then what if you have devices that aren't on Philips? So then you, the Philips hub has to interface to something else. Uh, and you can see where it starts to get complicated. Um, just this week, I, my son bought a house and this week or two weeks ago, and he's installing a whole bunch of stuff. And, um, you know, we were talking about the network, and he's like, okay, I'm going to get a, a, a camera for my, my front door, but I, you know, I don't want to get a ring camera. And I'm like, okay, why? And he said, well, the problem is I'll get data gets with the cloud and has all sorts of problems. And, and you know, we were laughing about, you know, using uh, Amazon Echo or, or that type of interface. He said, oh, nobody uses that anymore because that, you know, again, what you see a lot is companies sort of getting involved. I can make money with this. I can market something. People have complained, for example, Amazon Echo is not trying to sell you things too much. So stuff that started out great um, starts to kind of not be so great over time. Um, and that's a sad, I think it's a sad aspect of home automation. I don't know how to fix it. Uh, but I do know that a lot of organizations that we consider to be trustworthy and ones that would honor uh, the user experience have really fallen uh, in, a, in a poor way. And it's very disappointing. Um, so that is a cautionary tale to sort of try and maybe when you're starting, stick with things that you control that does, don't have necessarily a cloud requirement and are, and are fully functional at a level that you can control because when you're talking 20 years, which is what I've been doing this for, the idea of pulling stuff out of the wall and changing it is just really unpalatable. I had a friend who bought a house, big on home automation, and he put outlets, smart outlets, in every single room. So every outlet was taken out and smart outlets were put in. The problem is that those outlets were not designed to be very reliable. And he basically told me that every, every three weekends or four weekends, he had to take an hour out to, to pull out an outlet and replace it. And I'm like, oh, that sounds really bad. You know, just the idea of the outlet becoming now something that becomes non-functional or the switch becoming non-functional because the technology has failed and now it's now on you to, so this is, this is where the whole thing gets weird. Like, I'll tell you the time I started with X10, I, um, I told you about distance. So we had a light in the foyer, in the entryway. And my wife says at night, sometimes as she's coming downstairs, she'd like to turn the light in the entryway on from the second floor because she has to come down the stairs and they're dark, right? So she'd like a light switch. So I had an electrician out, and he said, he said, um, you know, we, we had him do the work we needed done. And I said, you know, by the way, let me show you this. I said, there's the light down there. 
on the first floor. I said, my like, wife would like a switch right here. And he's like, well, he said, we'd have to open the wall and the ceiling and get the light to go up and then up the wall and then fish it through and get the outlet, the, the switch there. But he said, you know, there's this thing called X10. This is about like 2003 or something. And he said, that's supposed to work really well. I said, oh, I've heard of that. I've been thinking to get involved. They said, how do you, have you ever done it? He said, you know, he said, I have quoted it on so many jobs and no one ever goes for it. Exactly what he said. And he's not expensive. He says maybe $600 or $700. But he said the reason that nobody went for it is because the homeowner did not want to be bound or hostage by that technology. And there is an undercurrent there that I think if we're doing home automation, we have to, we have to look head on. Um, the idea that, um, you know, the, the classic, the most hilarious thing is that when I give this home automation talk, I'm like, listen, I said, home automation's great, but if, you, if home automation was the way we started with a user interface, and then somebody invented the light switch, light switch would look like a genius idea. Because they'd be like, oh, look, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to open my phone to turn the light on, okay? It's, not, it's always going to work, right? And I just lift this little thing, and the light goes on. Look at that. That's fantastic, right? Um, that's ridiculous, right? But that, <laughs> I know we're all technology folks, and we love cool stuff, and it's great to control stuff that we couldn't control before. But your family just wants to turn the light on, and if they have to jump through hoops to do it, they will hate it, and it's their right to hate it, okay? We can't change their mind on this one. Uh, the other funny thing is I ended up putting X10 on that, on that little, you know, on that wall. I figured out how to do it. And then six months later, my wife said, you know, we have some lights in the family room. It would be nice if they went on, like, as it got dark every day. So I don't have to walk in the room and kind of fumble around and turn the lights on, right? I, I said, okay, yeah, I can do that. I saw uh, it'll take me a couple weeks. Now, of course, I was ready right away, okay, to do this because I'm like, oh, she's seen the value of this. I am so excited. Um, but no, 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 no. We're going to take a couple weeks because we don't want to seem too anxious on this, right? We don't want to oversell it. We don't want to kind of jump on it right away. Like, let the, let the people wait for a little while. We've been living this way fine. It's not a big deal. And let's do it right. Let's make sure that it's smooth. And I ended up for the way, and I'll show you some pictures, but the way it works, you just take the, you take the plug that goes into the wall, you unplug it from the wall, you stick a unit in the wall, in the plug, and you stick the plug into the unit, okay? You just put something between the plug and the wall, okay, the at wall outlet. And that thing is an X10 module, and you can control that. And then you can go out, and you can compute when the sunset is, and then you can say, okay, one hour or 30 minutes before every sunset, that light's going to go on. Okay, and then you can get fancy. You can say, okay, maybe that light's going to go on 50% for the first hour. And then it's going to get brighter at later. And then maybe a year later, you're like, okay, I got four kids. And I'm not sure how many of you know a lot of history. I'm a history person, but... The introduction of the incandescent light bulb completely changed the way people live their lives. Because before, you would either have candle or whale light or something. And when it got dark, you had to go to bed. And then you had to get up, right? Now that we have lights, people just stay up. And, and your kids will stay up. And your kids will, you'll be going to bed at 10 o'clock. And your kids will still be up at 1 o'clock. So I'm like, okay, I had this home automation fall. I said... I went to the family, I said, listen, I said, Pete, we should be going to bed. Because these lights are on at all hours, you think it's daylight, but it's not. You should be sleeping. So I said, what we're going to do is we're going to, all the lights are going to go off at midnight in the house. I said, you can turn it back on, the switch is right there. You can still turn it on manually. But to kind of get you moving, we're going we're gonna, to, and they said, okay, fine. And it helped them at least understand when midnight came 
And they had to take an active step to continue with the lights. And a lot of times the lights went on and they're like, okay, I guess it's time for bed. And they would go up to bed and that actually helped. And you can even do things like dim the lights at 11, right? And sort of bring things down a little bit um, because of the environment we've created with lighting really interrupts the normal cycle that I think is, is more healthy. Um, there also is some, there are also some other um, systems matter. I, don't, I haven't heard a whole lot about that and thread. Um, these were big, I think about a year and a half ago. I have not seen a whole lot of products in this area. But again, the idea was to create a unified API for home automation so that we could have that information sharing and that central thing. So it's, it's a really weird environment where you've got companies that really want to kind of control things and make money, and then, uh, th but then they want interoperability, and it's just a really, I think it's a very weird uh, situation at this point. I don't know where, I don't know what to tell you. Um, again, as I said before, you want to have something that control has the types of sensors and controls that you need. Now, in my case, I needed wireless remotes, I needed the plugs, I needed chimes, I needed um, a 220 uh, volt, volt control. I did not need HVAC, although that would be a natural thing to do. I didn't need doors or locks, um, but again, that would be a very natural thing to do. I needed a, an interface. I needed a, a Linux interface because I was running Unix. I ended up using um, an X10 application called HeyU, H-E-Y-U, open source. Um, and it does allow you to control X10 devices from Linux. Again, there are, there are other, there, for all of them, they have a Linux tool you can use, okay? Um, Mr. House used to be popular. I guess the new one is the, is the one we talked about, but Mr. House is kind of cool. Um, X10 does have a problem. Um, signal reliability can be a problem in larger houses. Um, it's not clear that the technology has been around for now what is it, 40 years, uh, but still being produced. But again, not a whole lot of people using it brand new. It is very simple to replace. It is incredibly inexpensive. Just pick it, if, you don't, if something breaks, you pull it out, you throw it away, you go down to the basement, you get another one, plug it in, your family will never know. Um, so the joke is I have an X10 warehouse in the basement, which is effectively a little box that is probably one extra of everything. And you almost have to walk in with that assumption because again, uh, these are, you know, uh, an issue. Another issue, uh, cloud dependency, privacy. Um, you need to walk in kind of knowing where you are there. Uh, my son is uh, even more concerned than I am about that. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through this real quickly. It's basically the internals of how X10 works. Not that interesting probably to you. But effectively, the sine wave, 60 hertz goes up and down. And the way X10 works is that in the, in the point where the phase is crossing the zero line, meaning there's no electricity in that little brief time, it sends a signal that broadcasts through the entire house. And because of 60 hertz signal, you can effectively do that, I guess, 60 times a second, right? And because um, it crosses... Actually, it's, I'm sorry, 120 times a second because you're crossing on the up and you're crossing on the down, okay? Um, and that actually is doing that. So here's an example of the codes that it uses and you can see it sending it. It does send every, every code twice for like a verification. So the code has to come through twice until it identifies it. Um, this is a um, oscilloscope. If I maybe not something people see a lot of times, but oscilloscopes, um, and you can actually see the oscilloscope. And <laughs> that is the X10 signal on the oscilloscope if you're actually monitoring. Um, crazy, crazy idea they had the 80s that actually works. Okay, so again, there is an X10 standard design. It's 1975, so 49 years. Uh, this thing has been around. Um, Again, uses the, uh, the carrier wave, 120 bits per second, um, and you can control, control up to 256 devices. Um, again, the, this is the sort of uh, protocol for that. This is a, a bigger chart of that and so forth. Um, 
There is somewhat of a delay because, again, the signal has to be sent twice. You only have 120 bits in a second, so it's not as fast. Maybe as some other ones. Uh, it can be a problem with split phase electricity. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar, but 220 comes into your house and at the breaker panel, 120 goes one way, the opposite 120 goes the other way. And it's hard from sometimes to from, get from this angle, from this one phase to the other one. There are solutions to that. Um, other devices that cause line noise can affect it, particularly I found that uh, UPS devices can, are, are designed to smooth electrical interference and actually their work, they work against text. It's kind of interesting. Um, this is a two-phase diagram. Um, this is actually a fix to that. It's actually a device that joins the two phases. This is actually a dryer, which has, which has access to both phases. And this device actually kind of brings them together. I don't even know if that device is sold anymore, but you get the idea of how this works. Again, I'm not promoting X10. What I am promoting, and there's almost too many options out here, is you have to figure out what protocol is you're happy with privacy-wise and cloud dependency-wise, which one you're happy with in terms of the device availability, and then what devices have interfaces that you can control. The idea that I'm going to pick up my phone to control my house is a non-starter. It's not going to happen because that means that I'm the, my aunt is not, does not have a cell phone. My wife does not want to pull out a cell phone to do anything. I don't want to, frankly, pull out a cell phone to do anything. So the idea that I'm going to start a custom app to somehow do something fancy, it's a great parlor trick, but it's not something that I'm going to use for years and years that's, that I'm going to be happy with. I have to have automated control at the Linux level so I can kind of automate this and make it work with the flow of my family. Okay. Um, there, there are filters available. Uh, this is what a wall switch looks like. It's, this is a normal wall switch. That's an X10 wall switch. You'll notice just a button. And again, it will allow you to manually control any light switch that also has an X10 control. So again, if X10 stops working, no problem. Just press the button. No big deal, right? Everyone's happy. Um, this is some more, you know, a decor switch, they call it, a flat switch. Um, I have both. Uh, this is a panel. Th these are three-way. So this is, this is a three-way switch. And in this case, the three-way, the, the ground, the, the, the power side of the three-way is here. These other two, the power side of those three-ways are on other three-way switches uh, in the room. So again, I have a little link to explain how that works. This is a wireless uh, device. So it basically takes a, C, a battery in here, one of those little disk batteries, OK? And you basically just push the buttons, and it sends a wire wireless signal. You plug an antenna in nearby, specifically this antenna, and it picks up the signal and then controls the X10 device. So when my wife wanted a button upstairs, she got this. And you literally just stick it on the wall. There's, no, there's nothing behind that, <laughs> OK? It's just a flat thing you just stick on the wall. Um, every two years, I will go around and replace all the batteries. So again. It's, it's sort of that sort of requirement. Here's another wireless remote. It's actually used for the coffee maker. I'll talk about that in a little while. Um, this is, again, not something you stick on a wall, something you put on a table or, you know, in a drawer, um, and you just press it, and again, the antenna will pick it up, okay? This is a bigger remote with four. Um, this is, uh, this is a, I'm sorry about this, but this is a, 18, this is a, a 16 device remote right there. And you can actually see the wall outlet right here. OK, so this is the remote. There's the wall outlet. And there's an antenna somewhere else that can. There's a pool pump. I talked about this. Um, I needed something to control a 220 device. Now, some home automation systems just won't do 220, right? Because the requirements to build a 220 switch are different than a a 110 switch, um, the actual switch is right here. And again, um, I can control the pool pump from my house. When I, my pool maintenance people came, they're like, oh, you should really sell this. And I'm like, uh, I can't really do that because the switch I could sell, but the home automation part would require some. And what has happened is some of the newer pumps, this is a, this is a very dumb pump, 
but some of the newer pumps do have this type of capability, but they don't have, I think, the temperature sensing and so forth that, that's more sophisticated. But you, it does, I think, have some wireless control as well. Okay. Um, I mentioned HeyU, which is a program that just a Linux program you can send signals, and um, we do that a lot of the things from the command line. Um, this is actually the device that sends signals from the computer. So I'm just going to walk through this. A little geeky, but that's good. Back here, um, that's the server. This big black thing right here is a basically a, uh, not, a, not a rack server, but a tower. Okay, It's a super micro server right there. And what I have here is I have a USB to serial co co uh, connector. So if you're familiar with those, most servers now don't have serial ports. They have USB, you have to go USB to serial. A USB is serial. Now the serial coming out in this case is literally a ribbon cable. It's not like the big thick ones. And it literally plugs right into here. And then this will um, basically control the X10. So that's the way it, it's, this is broadcasting signals onto the electrical network. Okay, from the server. And that's what allows hey you to go across the serial cable to become, to go with USB to become the serial cable to then um, control devices on the network. So without that, you're in big trouble. But again, things still work. You just got to press the button. This is what a log of what uh, X10 actually looks like. So the concept is that you've got, um, at certain time, we have um, a house code and then some activity. And we can, uh, based on the name of the device, we can actually identify, we can name one of the 256 devices that's supported, and then we can literally say, turn on Catherine light, turn on family room light, and so forth. Um, again, we wrap this in a shell script. Here we have a, um, something called X10 monitor, which basically just gives you a log, continuous log of activity. And then you can basically log that activity to a log file. And then you can trigger actions on, on X10 things. So for example, if somebody presses a button, you can decide, I want three lights to go on or I want the coffee maker to go on for 15 minutes. Or if somebody opens a door and the garage is also open, I want something else to happen. This is where I talked about earlier, the concept that you're going to want to bring these ideas together as you're going through them. Okay. So the basic idea is you've got some kind of input, whatever it is, from X10, from your computer, from somebody typing a command, from an email arriving, could be anything. Okay, and then you run a program and then that generates some kind of output, but it's again, instead of the output appearing on the screen, it effectively now can control things in your house. Okay, so inputs could be user commands, again, something typed from the command line. It could be a timer that you set. It could be a dawn dusk sensor. It could be the idea of uh, sunset time, right? It could be somebody pressing a remote. It could be caller ID. I'll show you an example caller ID in a minute. It could be dialing the telephone or even things like websites and going out and getting temperatures. And then lights, you could turn on lights, you could start motors, you can start appliances, you can make sounds, you can uh, make messages on the server, and you can even, um, we have a slideshow and actually things happen on the slideshow when certain activities happen, okay? Um, I don't want to overwhelm you, but this is literally the first floor of my house with all of the lights and devices that are controlled on that uh, case. So, for example, this is the family room. We have a, rece we have a, a receiver here. Um, we have the outside lights, which are actually listed um, as yellow right here. Um, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 are effectively the... Um, the bridge, the, the receiver, the antenna, the sunset detector, um, and here's the computer right here uh, in this location. Okay, uh, and on the second floor we have again bedrooms and more um, more activity like that. It looks a little overwhelming, but it's it's not as bad as you thought. And because, for example, if you look at the outside lights, my wife said, "Well, why don't we have the lights turn on?" when it gets dark outside, 
Um, I said, okay, it'll take a couple weeks. It did uh, because I had to order a bunch of switches that I didn't have before. And I also had to bring in an electrician because some of these switches were three-way and you have to put X10 on the power side of the three-way and I didn't really know how to do that. So I already had them there anyway, so he put them in for me. And it even got to the point where instead of turning the lights on every day, it actually randomly turns the lights on at different intensities every day. So it's not like a light show, but every day, every night when you look at the house, it'll look slightly different because some lights will be brighter that day, some lights will be dimmer that day. Um, they're still all on, but they, don't, they aren't on full, and they're on at different levels, so it gives it a little different look. Um, so, um, what would success look like, right? Again, um, how do you add changes to home automation that actually um, benefit your family? You start slow, you make incremental changes, don't go crazy. Um, except that some home automation tasks are impossible. One task I cannot do is figuring out when we receive mail, postal mail. Too hard to do, the mailbox is too far away. I still haven't figured it out. Um, you've succeeded when a family member asks for a home automation addition. If you're not getting those requests after a while, I'd say something's wrong. <coughs> Challenges. Uh, there's change, reliability we've talked about already. Uh, device longevity. Again, these things will die. It's every any piece of electronics, continuous use for 20 years. You're going to need to replace it at some point. Um, you have to look at cost, and then again, security policy, security privacy. I have a bunch of URLs in this slide deck. If you click on them when you download the deck, you can effectively read them. There's a lot of detail there. So um, I'm going to just highlight a couple really quick, and then we'll take some questions. Um, this is actually two modems. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with modems. Um, but what I have them, I have them set up so they actually have caller ID enabled. So when somebody calls the house, um, you get a message on the server, and there's a log file of who is calling at what time, right? And you can take actions based on that. So for example, here's a case of me calling the house. That is my cell phone number, and it actually uh, broadcasts this message saying Bruce's cell phone is on, and it will actually make a noise. Aside from the ringing, you have another noise when the phone rings to indicate it's a family member who's calling and not just anyone. So if you hear that noise when the phone's ringing, okay, it's one of our kids or my wife. You're going to want to get it, right? <laughs> um, so again, l small thing, not a big deal, easy to implement. Um, and again, um, you can dial the phone. So for example, um, we have a Rolodex and my wife wants to call somebody. She doesn't have to type the number in the phone. She can just pull it up, click on it, just say, call that person, and then it dials the phone because the modems are there. They, are, they can dial just like anything. She picks up the phone, phone's dialing for, right? Um, this is the way it works. The caller ID information comes in, and then based on the activity, we log everything, but then we have an optional chime that happens. And we can also look up numbers. So if somebody calls, we'll look it up in the Rolodex, the telephone number, and we will give a more descriptive. So for example, say, mom from cell phone, because her phone in the Rolodex, that number is recorded as her cell phone. Um, the dial, uh, the same, same issue. Uh, this is the second floor. Um, I give you an idea of what's going on. Um, and you can see the lights there. And again, this is the bedroom that we had the issue with. This is the wireless remote, so we don't have to worry about walking to turn the light on and back and forth. There's a remote right next to the bed. Um, so again, you just press it. Um, this, is, this is an example of defining some devices. So the remote bed command, the entry to couch, the tiff, these are different devices that we have, and you just, it's a text file, you just define it, and then you can call things by name. Um, here, I, I don't, I'm not actually, turning the couch on or setting it on fire. I'm turning the light on next to the couch is what, is what that is. Um, so, oh, this is kind of a cool one. If you're watching a video, uh, like a movie or, or TV show in the family room, you turn on, you hit a button to do video and it will dim the lights and kind of make one of the lights like half. So it's kind of cool. Um, 
you can do things from cron. So for example, here's a bunch of stuff that happens based on the time, based on, um, you know, for example, at dawn or dusk, it'll do certain things. Um, pretty straightforward, good, good ex I think good use of home automation. Um, dusk and dawn, we talked about that. You can record when the dusk and dawn is going to happen. Um, this is, again, um, if you're using motion activity, uh, then when you have <coughs> motion <coughs> at a certain time, you can basically turn on certain lights. Um, this, is the, this is actually one of the remotes that my wife uses for coffee. Uh, that's the coffee maker. That's the device for the coffee. So crazy of crazies, what happens is my wife, we have my, my aunt lives with us. They both drink coffee, my wife and my aunt. So my wife will wake up. She'll press the button. The button will ring a chime in my aunt's room, and it will turn on the coffee maker for 15 minutes. So then when she comes down, the coffee's kind of ready. Now, you have to have an aunt to set up the coffee maker, right? That, that part, I can't help you with. She could set it up the night before, but that's not the way it works in our house. Uh, my aunt does it when she wakes up, and then when she presses the button, it starts perking. Um, now, the other cool thing is she can do this from her phone. See, what happens, you press the remote, it turns on for 15 minutes like that. Okay, she has a little coffee button on her phone. So if she's out and she's on her way home, she'll press the button, the chime will go off, and then the coffee be ready by she, when she comes home, right? It's kind of cool uh, that she can do this. Yeah, she could call my aunt and ask her to do the coffee, but this is a much simpler thing. And when you're driving, just hitting the button, I think, is kind of cool. It's just a little, little button like that. Okay. Um, the way, the, the way that actually works is that the, um, the coffee button on the phone literally creates an SSH session to the house, which then runs, effectively sends a, an X10 command for the chime, which then also starts the coffee maker, right? So there's no, there's no X10 command running on the phone. It's really SSHing in and then running a command at that point, okay? Um, again, job scheduler, I talked about the ability of the pool pump to be running more depending on the temperature outside. Um, events in the calendar, picture directory, we actually have a sort of family screen, uh, like a slideshow. On the right has all the activity happening that day, like a calendar. And then when somebody calls, the caller ID will come right up on that screen for 30 seconds or 20 seconds. So, you, you know, if the phone's ringing, you just look over, oh, it's... Whoever, right? I know some people have phones that talk to you, but that's kind of awkward, particularly if you're like eating dinner. So it's better to have it a screen you can look at. To me, anyway. Um, this there's a button that, that that sort of sends a chime across the whole house to the time to eat, right? It's a button she presses, and again, it will turn off the slideshow for a certain amount of time. And nobody wants to look at pictures while they're eating, for example. Okay. Um, garage, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff I do with the garage. Um, things like when somebody comes home, there's a, a, an indication that the car has arrived so you know that person's there. Uh, the way I did it was actually to have a little X10 switch on the garage door. When the garage door comes, it pushes the switch and close the contact. That generates an X10 signal. I can then send a broadcast message on my server and so forth. Okay. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like, and there's, I don't know if you can see it. It's up, it's up here, right here, but I don't think you can really see it up there. Okay. Um, yeah, you can maybe see it here. There's an X10. You see this little wire right here? That's part of it, and then it's kind of right there. And there's a little, when that comes up, it presses a, a, a button. So again, X10 has that ability where you can just, like, on-off switch kind of thing. Oh, there it is. There, there's, the, there's the X10, and there's the little connector. You see this little bar here? So when it shuts, it pushes that shut, and then we get an extent signal. Okay. Um, Arduino, I looked at that kind of as an idea. I haven't really figured a good use for it yet. Um, but again, um, so uh, let's take a couple questions. I know this is a lot of information, but uh, what, what questions do you have? Yes, sir. Yes. Packages and stuff 
we do we do have that. What we don't have is something that activates when the mail's put in the mailbox. That's what we're waiting for. Yes. Oh, okay. All right, I'm going to have to look for that. Thank you. Yes. I can do that. The problem is the mailbox is very far away. So getting power out there is impossible. I didn't want to put a battery out there. I don't, I'm not sure. It's a toughie. What do, yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was looking at. It's a solar panel that charges and then get, I can pick up a signal in the house. Yeah. Other questions? Thirty seconds. All right. Well, great. I hope you're having a great time. Thank you so much.